everybody, it's Mr. Matthew here, and in this video we're going to talk about the cell cycle and how the cell cycle gets regulated. So I'm going to get right to it. So we're going to be talking about the cell cycle in general, and the cell cycle is a series of steps that all cells undergo as they grow and they perform metabolic processes and then prepare for division and then ultimately divide. And so we're going to be hitting upon the three components of interphase, which is G1, S, and G2 phase. We will also be talking about uh, the M phase or mitosis or cell division. Uh, we'll also hit upon cytokinesis a little bit, which is at the end stage of mitosis. I'll also bring up what happens if cells don't divide and, and what phase those roll into. And we're going to be also talking about what regulates the cell cycle and what happens when those regulations go wrong. So let's talk about the cell division processes that take place in the case of eukaryotes. So if we have a parent cell, all parent cells are going to have their set amount of chromosomes. This example of a parent cell has two chromosomes in it. And when that parent cell undergoes DNA replication, which takes place in S phase of interphase, it doubles the amount of DNA, but it doesn't actually change the amount of information in the cell. It just goes from one red and one blue chromosome, one that came from each of the parents. And now it has two copies of the information of that red chromosome, each on a chromatid, and two copies of the information on that blue chromosome. Each of those two blue chromatids have the same information. Now, once that occurs, this cell could undergo two different types of division. If this is a regular old body cell, or if it's a cell that undergoes asexual reproduction, then it would go through mitosis. And in mitosis, it would pull those two separate copies of the DNA apart, and we would produce two daughter cells that are identical to that original parent cell. If the replication is followed in a cell that produces gametes of a sexually reproducing organism, and that means that this is going to be in the germline of a cell. So important to note that if we were talking about, say, a human, this would be happening in tissues that would produce sperm or egg and not in, say, muscle tissue or epithelial tissue elsewhere in the body. It's only going to happen in specific cells that are going to produce gametes. But that cell would, rather than dividing the two copies of the information in half where we have the two red identical chromatids and they are pulled apart, we are going to pull the homologous chromosomes apart and then proceed to follow with an additional division such that the final daughter cells are going to have half the genetic information of the original parent cell. Now, this particular copy doesn't show synapsis or crossing over to show how the genes could get shuffled through that process, but it does show you the ultimate process that meiosis leads to half the genetic information of that original two chromosome parent cell that we had when we started this process. As I mentioned before, the cell cycle is highly regulated. It's got a series of events, and so we're going to talk a little bit about each of these. The cell cycle consists of our interphase. In the interphase, we have the GAP1, the synthesis, and the GAP2, or G1, S, and G2 phases. Uh, what happens mostly in G1 is growth. So you'll see a cell after it's divided. It's half the size it was before division, and so it's going to go through an initial growth phase. During S phase, or synthesis phase, we undergo DNA synthesis, so we're going to duplicate the amount of DNA, and so that's the idea of going from those single chromatid chromosomes to a double chromatid chromosome. It is important to know that during this phase, you cannot see them as those X-shaped structures, they would be in large untangled chromatin, but we're just going to make copies of our DNA so we'll have two sets of the genetic material when we are done S phase. During G2, it's also an additional phase of growth. It is also going to prepare the cell for mitosis, and then the M phase or mitosis phase is where cells would actually divide. Cytokinesis is the division of the cytoplasm, and that would happen right at the end of mitosis, dividing up all of the organelles that would be in the cytoplasm. This would divide up the mitochondria and other organelles such that each daughter cell gets an equal amount of information to proceed in the beginning of its next cell cycle. So one of the other things to know is that not all cells are going to perpetually divide. We actually know this of many adult cells that in the human body, once they get to their final adult stage, most notably like neurons, 
they generally don't divide again. And in fact, we have lots of adult cells that for large portions of time, once the cell has been formed, they'll do an initial growth, but they're not going to divide. And so they're going to pop out into what we call the G sub naught phase. And the G sub naught is the cells that are not actively dividing and that are proceeding through the cell cycle, but they're in a sort of frozen state from a cell cycle standpoint. But in many instances, uh, we've learned that you can have these cells re-enter if they were to re respond to appropriate cues. Non-dividing cells may exist in the cell cycle or be held in that G sub naught phase of the cell cycle for a, a long series of times. So it is important to note that there are some times where we will note that cells don't really seem to be in any of the traditional cell cycle phases and they've popped out into that G sub naught phase of of not actively dividing, not proceeding through the cell cycle, but just being an adult cell carrying out cellular activities. So what happens if a cell is going to pass the information to the next generation via mitosis? So that could be the next generation of cells in a multicellular organism or in a single celled organism. This could be how the cells divide and form two identical daughter cells through asexual reproduction. So what we will see is that the an initial cell will undergo a normal phase of, of G1, and then in S phase, we would see DNA replication occur. And then during the M phase, we would see mitosis, and those two daughter cells are identical. So mitosis is going to be the conservation of the initial genetic information into two identical daughter cells that have the genetic, same genetic information of the original parent cell. So in other words, when I'm in G1, of the initial parent cell, or I'm in G1 of one of the daughter cells, the genetic makeup of those cells are identical. All right, so mitosis is that process that ensures the transfer of complete genome from parent cell to daughter cell to form those two genetically identical daughter cells. But this is gonna play a huge role in uh, the growth of organisms where cells are gonna grow. And then once they've reached sort of a maximum size, those cells will divide producing two cells that take up that same room. And then when those grow, we will have doubled the size of the organism. You can be also be involved in tissue repair. So you can imagine if you have damage to skin that in that area where the skin has been damaged, that you're going to have some damaged cells. Those cells that were damaged will have to be fixed. And then you will divide healthy tissue into that place in order to have repaired tissue. You also, in a single-celled organism, can undergo this process in order to have asexual reproduction, as I mentioned on the previous slide. Now, we will couple this idea of growth also with the concept of surface area to volume ratio. As cells get larger, they have a harder time having material diffuse into cells and waste material out. So there is a practical limit to how large an individual cell can be and function appropriately. So when we think of mitosis, mitosis is going to play a regulatory function on how large a cell can be in practicality. And the process of cell division allows us to reduce the volume and increase the surface area of those cells so that we have a good surface area to volume ratio for cells to undergo uh, transport of materials inside and waste out of that cell on a regular basis. Now, mitosis also is going to alternate with that interface of the cell cycle, as we mentioned. So we don't normally see cells just divide and divide and divide and divide. While mitosis is crucial for taking one cell and turning it into two identical daughter cells, it is important to note that unless you are in a phase like embryological development, you are not going to have cells very rapidly dividing. They're going to spend some time in between divisions and some cells will even pop out and not divide anymore. And we're going to have regulation to make sure that cells do not divide too rapidly. We'll get into that regulation in just a second. So the other thing to know is that when we are in mitosis, mitosis is a highly regulated set of sequences where the cells are going to take the DNA that is not visibly in a set of chromosomes, form those chromosomes, break down the nuclear envelope, produce centrioles and produce spindle fibers, pull the chromosomes apart so that the identical chromatids are going to be pulled to opposite sides, reform nuclear membrane, 
at the end of telophase and then undergo cytokinesis so that each daughter cell gets equal amounts of cytoplasm and organelles. Now, it is important to know that uh, they say the names of the phases of mitosis is beyond the scope of the AP, but generally it's a good idea to know the major events that happen during the prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase, and that being the formation of chromosomes, removal of the nuclear envelope, formation of spindle fibers, lining up of those chromosomes on the center line, pulling them apart so that each of the pulls gets equal information, and then the formation of new nuclei and dividing of cytoplasm. So I would be familiar with that general sequence. Whether or not you'd have to name one of these photos one of those phases, that will not be required on the AP. So along with the idea, as I mentioned before, the idea of the cell cycle being a series of steps, there are also checkpoints that are found throughout the cell cycle that allow the cell to know whether it should be proceeding on to the next phase of the cell cycle or whether it should pa pause in the current phase that it's in. Now, these will be a series of chemical signals. Some of these will be impacted by regulatory signals outside the cell, particularly in multicellular organisms where cells are communicating with one another about, you know, the whether or not they're touching another cell, where they are in a layer, that sort of thing. Uh, and the other thing to note about this cell division and these checkpoints is that there are notes where this will make sure that everything has been proceeding accurately and adequately in order to proceed on to that next step. And so if something is going wrong at a checkpoint, you can either pause it or it actually could send the signal to the cell that this is a cell that is not behaving properly and it may be uh, a target for apoptosis. So as you can see in here, there's a couple of key checkpoints, most notably the G1 checkpoint, which is a restriction of cell growth before we undergo cell division, the G2 checkpoint, which is a checkpoint before we would enter mitosis or cell division, and then the M checkpoint to see that cell division is proceeding properly. You'll also notice that there are certain other compounds that are on the outside. These are notably cyclins and CDKs. CDKs are cyclin-dependent kinases. These are enzymes that are going to help with preceding the cell cycle forward. And cyclins are a group of compounds that help regulate whether the cell is ready to move on to that next checkpoint. So how do these cyclins and cyclin-dependent kinases control the cell cycle? Well, as a general rule... As the cell cycle progresses, what you will see is that cyclins will bind to CDKs and you will form a cyclin CDK complex. Now that complex will then get phosphorylated, which means that it will be activated. And so the, the kinase is going to be activating the cell. This activated CDK cyclin complex will then phosphorylate some sort of target protein that then says, ah, advance in the cell cycle. So what we will see here is that certain cyclins rise or fall during different phases. And these are noteworthy to say, oh, this should proceed to the next checkpoint. Now you can see there's a lot of different regulation pieces in here. You must have the, the cyclins, you must have the CDKs, you also have to have the target proteins that are involved as they go forward. And so the cell doesn't just barrel through the cell cycle step to step to step. There have to be a series of coordinated chemical signals in order to send this to the next step in the cell cycle process. So what happens if there's some sort of damage? So if there's disruptions to the cell cycle on the cell or the organism, one of the key things that we often see is that there could be DNA damage. So we generally draw DNA damage into two broad boxes. One of those is that the DNA damage is in non-replicating cells. So these are cells then like nervous cells or muscle cells or that sort of thing. And, you know, we can either, you know, repair the DNA and then the cell will proceed functionally. Or if the DNA repair doesn't quite work and there's DNA damage, this might ultimately lead to tissues aging or appearing to be aged. Um, and so we all know that you know certain uh, tissue doesn't look as young as other tissue. You know, you can think of uh, the fact that skin, for example, uh, over time will become aged and will look older. If you were to look at the skin of you know, a newborn or somebody who is much older, you're going to notice that there is a difference in what the skin looks like. And this may, this may be due to DNA damage uh, leading to the aging of that older individual. 
Now, if the DNA damage is into cells that are going to be actively replicating, these could be stem cells. They could also be tissue that just is highly dividing, like uh, epithelial cells in general. And what we would see is that uh, the cell cycle could stop and allow for DNA repair. So again, it would not proceed on to those next checkpoints. If there's damage to the DNA, that would be a signal that, oh, we should not proceed past that G2 checkpoint because there's been damage here. And so that DNA damage could lead to the cell being repaired, then the cell cycle will progress and you'll get normal cell division of that tissue. That would be your normal function. But if there's excessive DNA damage, this might just say that this cell is just not functioning and this cell should undergo apoptosis or programmed cell death. And this is another pathway that can happen. Now, if the apoptosis signals do not work properly, what you may end up seeing is that this cell could continue to divide, and this would be a case where the checkpoints aren't working out, and this could ultimately lead to cancer. All right, so what this all turns out to end up telling us is that there is a normal pattern of cell growth and division. Uh, normal growth and division will vary in the type of cells that we're looking at and the type of organisms that are undergoing that. If there is a, an issue during that cell cycle, the cells can pause and maybe fix those things, or they can target those cells to be destroyed through apoptosis. And if we fail to have that regulatory sequence, this could be part of the process that leads to cancer. All right. I hope that was helpful and I'll talk to everybody soon.